The horrific nature of apostles is something that's impressed upon us from the very beginning of Berserk. The Snake Baron showed us the levels of depravity to which many of them are willing to sink, and the Slug Count showed us just what it takes to make an apostle. For the majority of the series, we encounter apostles like them, grown adults that couldn't process their pain and so sacrificed it in exchange for the power to overcome it. But evil affects us all, and even the purest amongst us might end up being corrupted when exposed to its tide. This is exactly what happens to Rosine, who used to be a tomboyish village girl before her oppressive life transformed into what she'd always wanted to become with an evil twist. In this video, we'll look into what caused that change, what happened once it took place, and how Rosine started turning little children into murder hornet monsters, all to satisfy a dream that never existed. So, without further ado, let's jump right in. Who is Rosine, and why did she become an apostle? Apostles don't become apostles just because they've been chosen to become an apostle. Of course, that is the basic criteria for becoming an apostle, but it isn't the only one. A behelet is sent out from the abyss into the physical world with an owner attached to it metaphysically. Each behelet always finds its way to the person it's meant for, and no matter how hard they try to get rid of it, it will always return to them at their most desperate hour. That last phrase is the key to understanding how a human being becomes an apostle, because it's all about craving the power to escape one's own despair which is how Rosine became an apostle as well. If you're the owner of a behelet and you don't have the desire to use its power and transcend your mortal concerns, you simply won't become an apostle. The tricky part here becomes knowledge and awareness because most humans in the world of Berserk are completely unfamiliar with arcane objects like behelets and they tend to crave power at moments where nothing but their own pain matters the most to them. Rosine is one such person. Rosine grew up in a village situated at a military hotspot. Raiders leaving their lands ravaged each time a war broke out in the neighboring kingdom was a way of life for the people of Rosine's village. One day, things went too far and her mother became a victim of the violence men are capable of unleashing in that feral state. This happened nine months before Rosine's birth, so when she came into the world, her father rejected her because he wasn't sure she was his. Thus began the tragic, abusive family life of a girl who only wanted to enjoy her life. To the rest of the village, Rosine was a free-spirited woods child, a tomboy that loved doing all the things the boys did, like spending time in the forests and collecting strange rocks that looked like faces had been carved into them off the riverbank. She would begin her days by leaving home and end them well after the sun went down. The children of the village loved her for that because it meant they could go out and play and explore with big sis Rosine. That is how the girl named Jill, whom Guts rescued from a possessed tree in chapter 96, met Rosine in the first place. But everyone that was old enough, observant enough, or lived close enough to Rosine's home knew that this was plain escapism. The girl couldn't bear to be home because even when her father was in his senses, he would abuse her and her mother. And then one day, the abuse was too much for Rosine to handle, so she left her home, taking nothing but the behelet with her. She went to the fabled Misty Valley, fabled because it was once said to be home to the elves. Rosine waited for three days to see if any elves would come take her misery away. When none did, she made to leave, but that's when her parents found her. Rosine was initially happy to see them because it meant that they hadn't just given up on her. But when her dad slapped her and drew blood, she was reminded of the bitter truth of her life. In that moment, all she wanted was to make her old life go away and replace it with the elfin paradise in her mind. So, when her blood touched her behelet, that deep despair and desire summoned an interstice, and with it, the god hand. Rosine loved her parents to death, but she couldn't live like this for the life of her. So, when Void asked her for a sacrifice, she gave them both up in order to transcend her mortal pain. Once that happened, she emerged in the form she'd always imagined for herself, and started terrorizing the village that had given her so much trauma. But the interesting thing to note here is that, unlike most apostles, who look vaguely human in their base forms, Rosine's elf-like body is her base form not her transformed state. Why is this the case? Well, it has a lot to do with how Apostle creation works. Why does Rosine look like an elf in her reincarnated form? Does she have elf-like powers? Upon their rebirth, an apostle is given the choice to select a form that represents their true selves. Usually, this true self only comes out when they transform, and only the major outlines of their human forms remain. An apostle's features become decidedly demonic after ascending, even in their base forms. Their teeth turn into fangs, their nails become claw-like, and they have this eerie glow in their eyes which just tells you that these guys are far from human. But once in a while, there will be 
be an apostle whose base body itself feels like its released form. The egg of the perfect world is a great example of this. He was a behelet-shaped anthropomorphic egg for nearly all of his screen time, but there was a reason for that. He was supposed to hatch Griffith. The egg of the perfect world looked like a fleshy behelet because he was supposed to function as one. And in his final moments as a human, he felt that his true form was one that could birth the new world. Another apostle called Rakshas has the form of a murderous black cloak. He can shapeshift and damn near store an arsenal of weapons in his robes, but you would have a hard time trying to hit him because, number one, he's a sentient piece of cloth for the most part, and number two, he can move his head around to any part of his body. This form was given to him likely because Rakshas was a vile serial killer in his human life, and killing was in the very fabric of his nature as a person. The reason Rosine looks like an elf is similar, but far more tragic. It's because she thinks she's Peacath. The story of Peacath is one of the saddest in-universe fables in Berserk. It's about a sick boy from Rosine's village who was saved from death by the elves of the Misty Valley. But he was turned into a human-elf hybrid, which ended up alienating him from both worlds. Rosine used to come up with alternate happy endings for Peacath's story in the beginning, but by the time she reached her breaking point, she started identifying with him instead. Before departing for the Misty Valley, she told Jill that she was becoming Peacath herself, and that she was going somewhere that she belonged. At the moment of her ascension, Rosine's wish of becoming a true elf came true, because her identifying as Peacalf dictated her base form as an elf. Speaking of elves, Rosine looks a lot like an evil version of the Flower Storm monarch Danon, but her powers are completely different from an elf's. Elves in Berserk draw their power from spirit trees, for the most part, or at least a great elf like Danon does. Rosine draws her power from the Abyss because of her connection to it, thanks to the fissure her behelet opened in her heart. She cannot perform magic like causing quick distractions with a Rosine spark, or reading other people's emotions to help ease their pain. She can't produce elf dust to heal people by rubbing her wings together, her antenna cannot deflect oncoming projectiles like throwing knives, and the stinger on her back contains a lethal poison. In her first encounter with Guts, she damn near put the guy to sleep with it. And if he didn't know how to neutralize poison just because of the way he lives, he'd have been dead before conviction. But the the point we're trying to make here is that Rosine just looks like an elf. All her actual powers are those of a predator, aimed at softening up prey, which is classic apostle behavior. What isn't classic apostle behavior is her main ability, which is equally impressive and terrifying. What puts Rosine in a special class of apostle? How does she birth her mini soldiers? Most apostles live for two things, doing whatever they damn well please and serving the god hand. For 99% of them, the service is restricted to being performed through their own physical forms, but a select few can also draw from the Well of the Abyss to create soldiers of their own. Pseudo-apostles are only created by a handful of apostles in the series, but all of them are extremely powerful apostles who have a purpose greater than just fighting guts in the moment. Except slug count, of course. The Egg of the Perfect World created pseudo-apostles to speed up the incarnation ceremony. Emperor Ganeshka made pseudo-apostles to help him secure his victory over Griffith. And slug count needed a messenger, so he chose Zondark to be his daemon. Usually, the creation of a pseudo is short, quick, and grotesque, because it involves apostles injecting their power of evil into the target. The slug count made his pseudo swallow a parasite with his likeness attached to it. The egg of the perfect world stung his targets with one of its tentacles to make them pseudos, and Ganeshka just stepped on his converts to convert them. Rosine has an elaborate method for creating pseudo-apostles, and she doesn't just create a single type of pseudo, she creates two. The first time we meet Rosine in the series was in chapter 52, where we saw her distract Rickard so her fellow apostles could have a quick snack before the feast. If you look closely at the monsters chowing down on the pile of dead falcons, you'll notice that many of them are insect-themed. One looks like a praying mantis, while the other looks like a beetle. These guys aren't regular apostles, they're actually Rosine's pseudos, and a part of her guardian-type offspring. Following her ascension, Rosine started thinking of herself as a queen elf, but a queen without subjects is no queen at all. She had her little territory all marked out. The fabled Misty Valley that had been deserted for so long would be rejuvenated by her reign. But now she needed subjects, and people to guard those subjects. That is where the concept of guardians and playmates becomes relevant. We'll talk about the playmates first, because that is some of the most horrific stuff we've ever seen in a manga. After a certain amount of time had passed, Rosine started kidnapping children from her home village and other nearby villages to create her new family. Once she brought them back to the Misty Valley, she would incubate them in cocoons filled with a fluid that slowly transformed the children into pseudo-apostles. Once the process was complete, they would be born again as tiny little elves, no larger than Puck, but devoid of any of an elf's trademark pureness. Rosine's elves were malicious and aloof, because they were created 
within an environment that could effectively be called her womb, they were incubated with her thoughts on the world, and she viewed adults as being some of the worst creatures in the world. Her new Misty Valley was going to be a place filled with the voices of children, be it laughter or screams. So she gave her elves released forms that basically turned them into cannibal murder hornets. The reason why we called the cocoons of these elves a part of Rosine's womb is the way pseudo-creation has been set up in the series. Usually, apostles inject a part of their energy into another human. This is how Rosine creates her guardians, who are grown adults turned into pseudo-apostles with the purpose of protecting her elves. Additionally, they also act as her bodyguards when she leaves her nest, and they give Guts one of the tougher fights of his life when he attacks the Misty Valley. The Black Swordsman has to come up with a new move on the fly to take care of them, and if it was anyone else, they'd have died at the entrance. But because she isn't doing that to these children, who likely can't handle that kind of an energy surge, Rosine has to cover them in the amniotic fluid of evil, which is what she does. When she has a sizable enough army, she sends out her minions to local villages to eat through the livestock and any other organic being in their path before adding yet another soldier to their ranks. Once they're back home at the Misty Valley, these kids entertain themselves by playing war only they do it with live ammo. Rosine's elves reject the adult world, so they mock adults by doing the most extreme adult attacks, which includes skewering their peers with spears and violating whoever they found on the ground. It's a grim reflection of the psyche of what is effectively a child apostle. When players keep dying in your twisted games, no wonder you need more bodies to replace them. With these two layers of protection in place, Rosine usually doesn't get her own hands dirty. She just flies about using her massive wings, surveying the scene and directing the new fun activity of the day. But when she has to get involved herself, she does so with extreme lethality, considering she's faster than sound. Can Rosine break the sound barrier? why she is one of Guts's toughest opponents. One good look at Rosine will tell you that she isn't the fighting type apostle. Fighting type apostles usually have bulky bodies and many limbs that help them beat down their opponents into bite-sized chunks. The fact that she can fly should tell you that she's a flight type apostle, but don't conflate that with her having a cowardly disposition towards real battle. This girl is extremely fast, and we mean so fast that she damn near breaks the sound barrier every time she takes a fight seriously. The first time Guts encountered Rosine, he was in the middle of trying to rescue a child from her nasty pseudo-elves. Rosine was annoyed by this and attacked him, but no one could see it coming, not even Guts. One minute she was dive-bombing him, the next she had pulled up into the sky like a plane. Guts swung for her, missed, and ended up getting stung by her natural poison dispenser. As the venom ran through his veins, he braced himself for a second pass, but was saved by Jill, who stunned Rosine into a retreat. At this point, the Alpha Apostle wasn't using her sound-splitting speed, but she was fast enough to disorder and Guts, whose reaction time is arguably the best in all of Berserk. When she broke out her actual full speed, pure instinct is what kept Guts alive. What makes Rosine one of the toughest opponents Guts has ever faced is the kind of fighter she is. The sheer number of murder minions she has is enough to overwhelm most armies, but she herself is the greatest weapon in her arsenal. Guts has been fighting apostles for over two years by the time he meets Rosine, so squashing a few bugs like her little elves was no big deal for him. He put the flat of Dragon Slayer's blade to good use and burnt them all down in flames when he got the chance. For the Guardians, he used his cannon arm and sword in conjunction to create an arc of death that no one could escape from they got caught in it. But with Rosine's true form, all that was meaningless because Guts has to hit her first, and that's possible only if he can catch her. While her elf-like body is good for mobility through the dense vegetation of the Misty Valley and fooling mortals into thinking she isn't a monster, the truth is that Rosine is an apostle. As an apostle, it's in her nature to kill and devour humans, and for particularly strong humans like Guts, the form she takes is that of a giant Luna Moth that could give Mothra a run for its money. Rosine's release state is at least four times Guts' size, and considering he's around six feet tall, that would put Rosine at a height of seven to seven and a half meters at least, wings and all. That sounds like a small number, but think seven meters vertically and you start seeing the problem here. Now tack on to that the fact that her proboscis is basically a razor sharp lance and her air propelling hind extensions and you start seeing how she can go supersonic. When Rosine starts her supersonic attack on Guts, he barely has time to switch his grip so he can deflect her oncoming body. The sheer force of it is so strong that he's knocked back through several trees and when he regains his footing, he barely has time to get the ringing out of his ears. Rosine comes in for a second pass while screeching that there is no one faster than the Queen of Elves in the entire world, 
and she might just be right. Remember those air-propelling hind extensions we just mentioned? Well, what they do is suck in air from the environment around the base of Rosine's released form, and they blow it all out at once to give her a massive speed boost. She has multiple suction bags underneath her wings, and when they work in unison, Rosine breaks the sound barrier. The sonic boom her body produces is loud enough to stun whoever's in the vicinity into inaction, and that's the moment she uses to strike their heads off. Usually, that is. Rosine is undoubtedly one of the fastest apostles we've ever seen in the series, if not the fastest. The only other being capable of matching her speed somewhat would likely be Ganeshka, and that too because his mist form basically allows him to travel to wherever there's ample moisture in the air. No other apostle can match her torpedo-like speed, and this is what makes her one of Guts' toughest fights in the series. Rosine makes three passes at him, and each time Guts is saved by last-minute instinct. The fact that he took one of her antlers off her head before her transformation also contributed to his survival, because if he had to deflect two death skewers at the same time, things would have gotten dicey. The only way for him to defeat her was to stop her advance, and luckily for Guts, she presented presented him with an opportunity to do just that. For all her insane tricks, Rosine was still a child, not just emotionally, but mentally as well. She committed many heinous acts as an apostle, yes, but she was manipulated into it by the God Hand and her inability to rise above her own circumstances. She didn't quite understand what she was giving up when she sacrificed her parents for the life she desired, so naturally, expecting her to understand the nuance of a battle when she was probably used to winning effortlessly is a bit too much. It's sad for her though, because if she had even an inkling of just how badly she had guts on the ropes, she wouldn't have thought of doing something as stupid as slowing down to get him good. Rosine should have just pressed the attack at the same speed she started with, because that break in speed is exactly what Guts wanted. If you've never fought the Black Swordsman before, or are just not used to fighting, you forgetting he had an arm made of metal could be forgiven, provided you're cool with death. And turns out Rosine is that kind of gal. She slowed down just to get a good thrust in on Guts, and when she saw him raise his arms in an attempt to save his head, that only made her put her guard down even more. By the time she realized his other arm was made of solid metal and that it had broken her other antenna as well, Rosine and Guts were well in the air. The Apostle was sure that she had secured her victory because had Rosine sped off with Guts at the speed of sound from that height, he'd have been ripped to shreds like she predicted. But you know how putting all your points into one stack can make you vulnerable to all sorts of deviousness in video games? Well, that's basically what happens to Rosine here. She was extremely fast, but her durability was extremely low, and her battle experience even lower. She took her eye off the ball for a minute, and Guts blew her apart with his arm cannon. That shot alone was enough to fatally injure Rosine, but what did her in was her last attempt at flight. In the final moments of her life, she expressed grief and regret over what she'd done, and fear over what the Black Swordsman was going to do to her. Before things got there, Guts's hand was swayed by Jill and Puck's words and the arrival of the Holy Iron Chain Knights. For once, an Apostle died a somewhat serene death, flying over the hills of the Misty Valley, thinking of the good times with her family. Marvelous Verdict Rosine's melancholic ending isn't the only sad thing in this video because that's all we've got for you as well. Rosine is one of the most polarizing apostles from the series because she will likely never get a proper anime adaptation. But if she did, it would prove what we've been saying throughout this video. She was one of Guts' toughest opponents, despite being the easiest to kill from a physical perspective. Her tricky anatomy played a giant role in making her such a threat, and this was before Guts had the Berserker armor, so you know this win is extra special. Or at least that's how we feel, but what do you guys think? Let us know your thoughts about Rosine in the comment section down below. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and we'll see you guys in the next one. Until then, keep on struggling, strugglers.